today's teaching text is from Mark 15 and verses 40 all the way to uh, 16 and verse 8. There were also women watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joses and Salome. In Galilee, these women followed him and took care of him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. When it was already evening, because it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, who was himself looking forward to the kingdom of God, came and boldly went to, P to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had already died. When he found out from the centurion, he gave the corpse to Joseph. After he bought some linen cloth, Joseph took him down and wrapped him in the linen. Then he laid him in a tomb, cut out of the rock, and rolled the stone against the entrance to the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, were watching when he was laid. Chapter 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. They were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? Looking up, they noticed that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he told them. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they put him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. They went out and ran from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. And they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Fam, this is our 13th week in the Gospel of Mark. Can you believe it? It's been a journey, let's be honest. And uh, the finish to the gospel is a rapper. It ends with great news. And that news is Jesus lives. Just let that sink in. I mean, we've sung it this morning. We've prayed it this morning. We heard from Sanaba about the meaning of it this morning. It's been a morning filled with proclamation and truth and life. And I've loved every moment of it. Let me catch you up. And just to remind you of where we came from since Friday, we had two pop -up, uh, popcorn reflections now about Friday specifically. So let me just show you the photos again. Jesus died in this place, Skull Hill, Golgotha, on a little footpath just outside Jerusalem. Just in case you weren't here on Friday, eye socket, eye socket, nose, mouth. There's the skull, Golgotha. Vandile just read what happened to the body of Jesus. We are going to get back to that now, but let me show you what a garden tomb looks like from the first century. So this is what it would be. Massive rock with a massive cavity with an entrance. The entrance didn't have a door like on hinges, but the entrance could be closed by a stone. So if you would go into that garden tomb, what you'll see is a place where you can lay down a body, and usually how it would work is after it being anointed and being wrapped, they would put down a body, they would close the grave, and they would leave it for a whole year for the body to decompose. After the body is decomposed, they would go back in, they would throw away the cloth, they would gather the bones, they would put the bones in a smaller grave, and then they would open up the place for the next body. Let's call it a family tomb. If you want to, let me show you how thick the stone was because our teaching text says it was a big stone. That is a, probably a four feet in terms of width, right? So put your two feet together and then add another two feet. A stone that thick being rolled in that cavity is definitely 
very, very heavy. And obviously that stone had to be big enough to close that huge hole. So that's where we left each other on Friday. Now, if you follow the flow of today's text, you'll see in 15, 40 and 41, it tells us why the woman in chapter 16 knew where Jesus was. Verses 42 to 47 tells us how Jesus got into the grave and also why the woman went back in chapter 16. It is actually quite funny and also very significant. We'll get to that now. And then in chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, it tells us what happened this morning, the morning that we're celebrating today after the crucifixion. It's referred to in the text as the third day. Now, okay. Where do those words come from? Jesus predicted this more than once in the Gospel of Mark. Will you look at it with me quickly? So look at chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus says, uh, the text says, Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders. That happened on Friday. Chief priests, Friday. And scribes, Friday. Be killed, Friday. And rise after three days. Jesus told them, I will rise from the dead after three days. Not only once. Here's the second time. Chapter 9, 31. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. Very early Friday morning. They will kill him Friday. And after he is killed, he will rise three days later. Second time. Third time. Mark 10. Verses 33 to 34. See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes. Thursday evening, Friday morning. And they will condemn Him to death. Friday morning. Then they will hand Him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock Him, spit on Him, flog Him, and kill Him. Friday. And He will rise after three days. Jesus predicted that this would happen. And now we see today, on this day, the third day after his death, it actually happened. It's Mark 16, verse 6. Dandile just read it to us. In that little garden tomb that I showed you, there is a door now with a hinge, obviously to keep tourists out. And this is what the door says. He is not here, for he is risen. Fam. I mean, that's an echo or just a rearrangement of Mark 16, verse 6. I cannot tell you what it does to you when you stand there in Jerusalem next to the garden tomb and that door just shouts at you saying, He is not here. <laughs> it's just a piece of wood. But the words on the wood is life-changing. I stood there going, Oh, I think I got a little spiritual stroke or attack there. Christ is risen, and you, O oh death, are annihilated. Christ is risen, and the evil ones are cast down. Christ is risen, and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen, and life is liberated. Christ is risen, and the tomb is emptied of its dead. For Christ, having risen from the dead, has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. To Him be glory and power, now and forever, and from all ages to all ages. Amen. What a poem. And I wasn't shouting at you for effect. It's got exclamation marks in it. Do you know what I mean? It's headline news. It's supposed to be proclaimed to the world. To be honest, this is such a good poem, I could actually drop the mic and leave. I want to ask you a question. Is this what you feel about the resurrection? Is this what you know about the resurrection? Is this what you believe about the resurrection? Is it good news to you today? I was running in Irene this morning, coming down Wellington Avenue, looking east, sun coming up over the hill that's called Cornwall Hill. And I was listening to Resurrecting, the song that we sang now. 
And as the chorus was playing, by your spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. Guys, I lost my mind. All of a sudden my pace went down from 5 minutes 12 a K to 4 minutes 30 a K. It just, it overwhelmed me. And as I was running, I was punching the air and waving my hands. If you see CCTV footage, you can tell people that it's your pastor. He was not crazy. He was just overwhelmed by the resurrection. Okay. That's how I felt this morning. And I've been preaching this message for 17 years. Because it is truly good news. How about you? Is it good news to you today? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, when we pray to you, we know that you are alive. And we are so, so thankful for it. We said on Friday that we can't imagine our lives without you. Sometimes we lose loved ones and we have to carry on without them, knowing that they won't come back. But that we'll have to wait for us to go to them. But you, Lord Jesus, you came back. And that changes everything. So Naba said, if the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. And that's what we believe here today. So I pray that you would work deeply in our minds, that you would work deeply in our hearts, and that you would charge us as your followers to live lives on mission and of significance proclaiming this good news. We have a phenomenal message of good news for the world, Lord Jesus. Help us to appreciate that today. Help us to understand it and help us to treasure it and to proclaim it in your name and for your glory. We pray that in your name. Amen. So the story of Easter, the story of resurrection, it's told in all four Gospels. And in all four Gospels we see the woman who followed Jesus finds his tomb empty and they are delivered a message. Let's call it a heavenly message or a message from Jesus through the angels. Of the four accounts, Mark is the shortest. Now, this event of Easter, of the resurrection, in the Gospel of Mark, is captured in verses 6 and 7. Just look at it with me quickly. Here's the message. Don't be alarmed. You can follow the highlights. He has risen. Go. Tell. He's going ahead of you. You'll see him. That's the message. It's, it's phenomenal news after what happened on Friday and after this quiet Saturday. Lebo, I had a laugh now when you shared about, um, about Holy Saturday. Usually what I would do on Holy Saturday is I would go for a run and then I would pretend as if Jesus is dead to experience something of life without him. And I would usually restrain myself for half of the kilometers that I run to not pray. And then when I turn around, I would go, yes, Jesus, I'm so glad you're alive. I failed at two kilometers on Saturday. I was running, feeling all somber, seeing the sun come up. And then I just burst out laughing on two kilometers. And I'm like, ah, Jesus, I can't hold it. I have to speak to you now. <laughs> because I know that you're alive and that you're not dead. It's the first time in many years that I failed to hold it in. But it's because he's, he's not dead, he, he is alive. And there's the message. He has risen. And not only that, he's waiting for you. You'll see him. Now this message challenges us, I think today, and this is my message to you, to think differently, so go to the head, to feel grace deeply, go to the heart, and to live out a mission that can change our lives. Right? So think head, heart, hands. The resurrection has implications for all of it. And it shows us that the life-changing power of Jesus rising from the dead has a massive effect on our lives. So here's three questions that I'm going to ask. It'll just help us to frame our time together. Jesus lives. Awesome. We've said that and proclaimed that. How should we think? How should we feel? And how should we live? Are you guys with me? Okay, let's tackle them. Let's start with how should we think. Let me give you the answer before we work through the text. The answer is we should think differently. It challenges all of the thoughts that we have. Let's work through the text. Follow the highlights. It'll be on the screen. Let's start in verse 40. Women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, 
and many other women. We'll see in verse 47, Mary Magdalene and Mary. We'll see in 16 verse 1, Mary Magdalene and Mary. In the first century, when Mark wrote this gospel, women could not testify in a court. The testimony of women was not trusted. Calcis, the well-known pagan philosopher, said, this is what he wrote in his works, we all know that women can't be trusted, for they at all times are hysterical. That was like the common theme in the first world. Now Mark says, woman, not only does it say, does he say it once, he says it three times, and not only does he say woman, he says woman, and then he names specific women again and again and again. Why? Because this really happened, and these were real women. And it didn't matter if the culture at the time wouldn't listen to their testimony. Mark wrote it down because it was undeniable. Think about this, fam. If you wanted to create fake news in that time, you would have written the Apostle Peter, the one called the Rock, and the two boys of Zebedee, Boanerges, the sons of thunder, James and John. They saw him, and they paraded him around, and their testimony couldn't be refuted. If he wanted to create fake news, he would have chucked the woman. But he didn't. Why? Because he's not creating fake news. <laughs> Why? Because this really happened and someone saw it and you could ask them and they would tell you. That's how history was written in that time. And this is an important point for us. He, remember guys, in that time they didn't have a cell phone that they could take a video of the incident. And then replay it and WhatsApp it to other people. In that time, only 2% of people could write. So even though you saw it, it's not like you could write an affidavit because they just couldn't write. They were an agrarian society. They were farmers, most of them. You couldn't replay the news or go on YouTube and watch it again. So what did you rely on in that time? Eyewitness testimony. Ask the people who saw it. If only one person saw it, whoo, it's difficult to corroborate it. But if more than one person saw it, you, we're in with a deal. If more than two people saw it, how can you then refute their testimony? Because you weren't there now, were you? Now Mark says, two women and some other women. The other Gospels tells us that Peter and uh, the Apostle John also ran to the grave. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared to more than 500 people. Why is this movement still alive? Because Jesus is alive. <laughs> Think about it, fam. 12 people whittled down to 11, and now this faith has 2.2 billion confessing people. And the leader died. But the movement didn't stop because the leader didn't remain dead. Think about it. Every single kingdom, every dynasty we've ever had, the moment the leader is gone, it all goes... <laughs> that just means to the rafters. <laughs> it stops. Not the Christian faith. On the contrary, this risen Jesus and the testimony of this risen Jesus exploded. Like the church literally exploded. We had 3,000 conversions after the first sermon. Think about it. 11, they chose another one, then there were 12, then there were 120 people in the upper room, 3,000 added to them. A few days later, Peter preaches, 5,000 added to them, and the church just exploded. Are you telling me that all of this could be possible if the leader was still dead? No. How did the apostles work up the courage to be crucified, to be burnt at the stake, to be thrown into pots of boiling oil for their confession in Jesus? Because he's alive. I saw him. He said, peace be to you. He breathed his spirit over us. He chowed fish. We spent 40 days with him, unpacking what all of this means. We saw him ascend to heaven. You're welcome to kill me. I'm definitely not going to change my mind. Because it's irrefutable that he's alive. 
And Mark has enough confidence in that very testimony that he's alive, that he didn't whitewash the script and say, some people, possibly some women, but definitely some men. No, women. That already has to challenge our thinking. And just on the other side, I'm a gents. There were no gentlemen there. They went fishing. Not proverbial, literally. How sad is that? The only apostle we know of that was close to the cross was John. And Jesus looks at him and goes, John, please take care of my mom. Yeah, what a job. Can you imagine? I mean, I love my mom. And I would love to take care of her. And now you're asking me to take care of your mom. But, I mean, you're not any normal person. Do you know what I mean? You're the Messiah. Imagine that. Okay, Tani. <laughs> yeah. Hello, hi. <laughs> Let's go. You can, you can stay with me now. But all the other guys, gone. Peter betrayed him in such a deep way that he even cussed when a young girl, very inappropriate to cuss in front of a young girl. Well, it's always inappropriate to cuss. When a young girl said, hey, hey hang on, you're one of the Galilean gentlemen. No, not at all. Not the socky, not the vil. That's me softening the cuss words that he used. Let's look at verses 42 to 47. Joseph of Arimathea rocks up. He was a prominent member of the Sanhedrin. That was the Jewish council. He was a secret follower of Jesus because he was looking forward to the kingdom of God. And he came boldly, went to Pilate, and asked for Jesus' body. Okay, now hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. The very people who he's a part of accused Jesus of blasphemy, in the end wanted him sentenced to death, in the end shouted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And among those guys was this guy. Believing what Jesus said, struggling with what his political party and his religious party said and what the Messiah said. He believed it so firmly that he boldly went to Pilate. Fam, they had to convince Pilate to crucify Jesus. Pilate said, I don't see any guilt in this man. Do you guys remember that? This was a traumatic incident for Pilate. Just by the way, you guys might not know this, Pilate hated the Jewish people. And he hated going to Jerusalem. That was the worst part of his work. But he had to go there to show Roman muscle. Pilate lived in Caesarea, beautiful, by the coast, long beach where they would run sprints and have horse races. He was an aristocrat, he had lots of money. Hated going to the mountainy, dry area of Judea. And Pilate's hope was always that I would go to Jerusalem and come back and I don't have to do anything. And things were going well that whole week until that Friday morning when they woke him up. Ba, 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 ba. You have to sentence this guy to death now. Pilate is still in his pajamas. Pilate goes, oh, come on, you Jewish folk. Sort it out yourselves. Eventually they say, no, we can't because we can't send the son to death. Pilate goes, okay, let me hear your case. Pilate's wife says in a different gospel account, Woo, I had a dream. You shouldn't touch this. Don't get involved. Pilate goes, guys, he's not guilty. Washes his hands in front of everyone. In the end, capitulates under the pressure. History tells us Pilate went back to Caesarea and never returned to Jerusalem. He died a depressed, lonely man. He would walk up and down the beach, and up and down the beach, and up and down the beach, every single day, because of what he did. Unbelievable, huh? Now they convinced Pilate. Pilate gave them what they wanted. And now someone from them goes, Pilate, Ita, just before Sabbath, can I have Jesus' body? Do you know how much risk is involved in Joseph of Arimathea doing that? If anyone from the Sanhedrin would know, they would probably flip. Well, one of his other mates did, Nicodemus. The Gospel of John tells us that Nicodemus helped him with all of this. The Gospel of Mark doesn't mention him. 
But this rich guy boldly goes to Pilate, asks for a body. Look at verse 44. Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already dead. And then Pilate pulls in the centurion. Do you guys remember the centurion? The one who got it? The one who said, my word, the way that Jesus suffered <clears throat> was so unique, I've never seen anything like this. He must be the Son of God. So the centurion gets pulled in. Tell him where the body of Jesus is. And look at verse 45. He gave the corpse to Joseph. Okay, hang on. A savior that has women around him, that has religious elite around him, that has a pagan governor around him, and that has a bloodthirsty Roman soldier around him. Yeah? Everyone's welcome. That challenges us to think differently now, doesn't it? This wasn't only for those who qualified. This was for every single person. Because in those categories of people, you would probably find yourself now, won't you? You can identify with one of them. And then, the death of Jesus is so undeniable that Joseph buys linen. Do you guys see it? But they don't mention that he buys spices. But in the teaching text that Tandile read, we see that Mary Mary and Salome bought spices. Because you needed spices and linen to wrap a body and to prepare it for burial. So Joseph goes and buys cloth. Joseph has money, and he spends his money on this guy that was just crucified and sentenced to death by an angry mob of religious folk that he belongs to because he believes something else about this guy. And then he wrapped him in linen. So here's the funny part. Joseph did a half a job. <laughs> That's why the woman had to go back. Can any woman in the place identify <laughs> with asking a man to do something, and then he does it half? That's exactly what happened here. Now, I have to come up for my bro Joe. He has never done this. Because men didn't prepare bodies for burial. It was a job of women. So in those days, men wouldn't touch a dead body because then I'm unclean. Well, someone has to touch a dead body. Yeah, all right, that's all right. Tell the women to do it. And then they can go through the cleaning rites and the cleaning rituals and the purification rituals after that. So now a man buys cloth out of compassion and belief, does half a job, and touches a dead body. It turns everything upside down, fam. Can you imagine Pilate seeing this guy approach him, and then seeing this guy plus his buddy Nicodemus touching a dead body? He must have fell over. And that's what... what I believe, it's not in the text, but that's what must have convinced Pilate. My word, there's something about this man. There's something about this man. They laid him, they rolled a stone against the entrance, and the two women's names are mentioned again. Mary Magdalene and Mary. Are you guys thinking differently already? Yeah? Right. Right. Let's go a little bit further on thinking differently. Sabbath was over. We know that now. Two ladies are mentioned again in verse 1. Thank you, Rudolf. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. Just side note, I'm always awake on Resurrection Sunday when the sun rises. I feel like it's a good spiritual discipline to just breathe in the cool air of Pretoria. I've lived, I've lived, I've lived here my whole life. To just breathe in the cool air of Pretoria and to think what must it have been like to get up early to see the sunrise and then go to the tomb. They say that the stone was heavy. They asked who would roll it away. And when they get there, it had been rolled away. Okay, now can we just stop there? Can you imagine how gutted you must be if you saw him die? You saw the gentleman bury him. You are certain of the fact that that is the spot. And because you loved Jesus, you buy spices with your own money. Remember, the rich guy bought the cloth. We don't know if these women had money. 
We know that women supported the ministry of Jesus, so some of them had. But they buy spices. They want to do a proper job and go and finish what the gentlemen have started. And now the, sto the stone is open. Can we just pause there for a second? How would you feel? How would you feel if you would go to a graveyard and as you approach the grave, it's been dug up? And you think that the body has been exhumed? Eh? Hey? Gauze, gauze, gauze. I, I, wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't know what to feel. They actually enter the grave, it says, enter the tomb, and then they see a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. They were alarmed. The guy can see it, obviously. And here's what he says in verse 6. Don't be alarmed. He has risen. Okay. I showed you that Jesus said three times that he'll rise after three days. Why didn't all his followers go to the grave after three days? Because they simply couldn't believe it. Fam, they saw Jairus' daughter raised from the dead. They saw Jesus' good mate Lazarus raised from the dead. After four days, he was stinking already. He had his proper grave clothes on. He came out of the tomb. They all see, saw it. And then Jesus said, take off his grave clothes. They were, they were literally participants in seeing Lazarus come back to life and taking all the cloth and the spices off of his body. And when the first day of the week came? Yes, what are you going to do today? I don't know. I'm going to go fishing. Yeah? I'm going to go home. Sure. I'm going to sit here for a bit. And then the woman goes, well, we're going to go to the grave, but not because we believe that Jesus arrived, we want to finish the burial job. Don't tell me that people in the first century had an easier time believing in the resurrection of Jesus. Have you heard that? Modern people like us, who are all clever and googly, say, yeah, yeah, look, it makes sense for first century people to believe in the resurrection. You know, they were ar ar archaic folk. They weren't educated like us. It's understandable. You know, they believed in all these spiritual things and miracles, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, really? The gospel shows us that it was just as difficult for them to believe it. And then the angel says, He has risen. Think differently. What's impossible in your head is 100% possible for God. If the tomb is empty, anything is possible, fam. Do you know that? Do you hear that? Does that penetrate your mind? And are you willing, in light of what happened here, to believe it? Because that's what the angel says to the woman. I know what you're thinking. You're not thinking right. He's not here. He's risen. Go tell. He's ahead of you. You will see. Jesus is alive. So how should we think? We should think differently. Fam, this is an important point. I know when I say, if the tomb is empty, anything is possible, it feels all encouraging and awesome. But that will mess with your head. And it has to mess with your head. It has to challenge us not to be stuck in our own thinking. The brain is a powerful organ, fam. And I don't know if you know this, but your brain is actually, newsflash, lazy. Your brain is unbelievably powerful and unbelievably lazy. Why? Your brain wants to identify a path and a route and stick to it. Think about using a different toothbrush or toothpaste or starting to floss your teeth or having to use medication on a daily basis for whatever reason. It's hard work, man. And your brain goes, ah, oh, this is way too much work. Why don't we just leave it? Because the old way was better. Huh? 
What happens when you get stuck in traffic? Do you know what happens when you get stuck in traffic? Your brain goes, oh, now I have to think. Because think about it. Your normal route to work and back every day, if there's no traffic, you don't even think about the route. Your mind drives it automatically. You switch on your indicators automatically. And now you run into traffic, load shedding lights are out, and you go, oh, snap, I'm so tired. Start yawning, don't know what to do, all chaotic. Our brains are lazy. But this challenges our brains in a big way. We have to think differently. Are you guys with me? How should we feel? Here's your answer. Graciously loved. Graciously loved. Look at verse 7. He is going ahead of you. You will see. Look at the two names being mentioned. Go. Tell his disciples. And Peter. He's waiting for you. Okay. I am not Jesus. My name is Rainer Meyer. I'm a human being, a sinner saved by grace. Fam. This was me. I would have gone. Listen up. You cowards, you betrayers, you immature boys who left me to die on my own after I taught you the way. That would have been me. Listen up, Peter, you loudmouth. Telling me you'll never leave me. I heard you cuss at the young girl. I heard you run away crying like a baby. That would have been me. <laughs> so glad I'm not Jesus. <laughs> Fam, his disciples deserted him. Peter denied him. After he was the sharp boy in the group, knowing that he's the Messiah. And what does Jesus say? I'm waiting for you. You'll see me. Hey! How should we feel after the resurrection? Graciously loved. Come. 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 That's the invitation. It doesn't matter who mocked. It doesn't matter who scoffed. It doesn't matter who blasphemed. Come. Come, just imagine that. <laughs> Think about the amount of love that Jesus has in His heart for humanity. And how He shows that to His disciples and to Peter. Hey, if, if I were them, if I was them, I would have gone, guys, listen, I've got great news. And let me just say, Jesus is not angry with you. Because they didn't do anything wrong now, did they? It was the gents who were fleeing. If, if, if I were them, I would have gone, listen, uh, I saw Jesus, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. He's not angry at you. On the contrary, he said, you all and Peter, you. He's waiting for you. And he's going to see you. And we know from the other gospel accounts that Jesus cooks them breakfast. And then goes, guys, come, come, come. Let's rest. Let's have food. And then he restores Peter and says, will you feed my sheep? Do you love me? Yes, I do. Awesome. You've lied before, but I'm going to believe you. Will you feed my sheep? Graciously, graciously loved. That is how we should feel. Are you guys with me? Can we do one more? How should we love? The answer is on mission. How should we live? On mission. Look at verse 7. It's got two imperatives, two commands. Go and tell. What must they tell? We listen to it. Jesus is alive. That's the message. <laughs> like, just go and tell. They ran out of the tomb... Verse 8 says, 
because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them. I can believe that. I can, definitely. And they said nothing to anyone. Oopsie. Since they were afraid. Screen goes black. Credits start rolling. That's how Mark ends. I know that your Bible has verses 9 to 20 in it. But that's actually not how Mark ended. The end of Mark was chapter 16 verse 8. The oldest manuscript we have of Mark stops here. What a cliffhanger! Have you ever watched something? And then it goes, whoosh, black screen, credits, and you go, no! No! You know what we usually do? We go, we will sit until after the credits because they might be. They just, they just might be something helping us out of this misery. Oh, I get goose flesh again when I think about the film Inception. And you see that top spinning, 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 spinning. Screen goes black. And you go, no! Did it fall over or didn't it? To this day, I don't know. I've been asking the Spirit fervently. No, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Why does Mark end this way? Because he wants you to decide if you will say something. Hey, Mark was a clever guy. They said nothing to anyone. Will you? Since they were afraid. Are you afraid? Mark's brilliant. That's why he leaves the gospel right there. Now praise Jesus. We know that they spoke up. Yes. <laughs> We know that other people saw the empty tomb. We know that other people saw the resurrected Jesus. We know the story. Luckily, we do. But Mark ends it like this, asking you the question, will you go and tell? And fam, that's the way that we should live in light of the resurrection. I was so charged up this morning that I almost, almost, ran through our complex on a victory lap. We have 48 units in the complex we live. I almost did a victory lap, going, Jesus is alive! Jesus, tok, 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 tok. Uh, pleasure, Jesus is alive! Tok, 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 Lorette, Jesus is alive! Tok, 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 tok. Banner, Jesus is alive! Tok, 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 Gerrit, Jesus. I almost did it. It was just after 7 in the morning, so it wouldn't have been appropriate. But that's what it should do to us. Is we should feel this charge to live on mission and to proclaim Jesus is alive. Let's end here. And then uh, our worship ministry can start taking the stage. I think this is our message today. This is the word that God placed on my heart. Let me show you. The resurrection of Jesus. I added some emojis. I had to. So this is the, oof, this is supposed to be the mind-blown emoji. Looks more like a cat. This is supposed to be the heart emoji. Nailed that one. And this is supposed to be the salute emoji. The resurrection of Jesus challenges us to think differently, invites us to feel graciously loved, and launches us to live on mission. Are you guys with me? The resurrection of Jesus challenges us to think differently. It invites us to feel graciously loved. And it launches us to live on mission. While they get ready, can I ask you to ponder these things? What is the Spirit saying to you this morning? Is there a mind shift that has to happen about the fact that anything is possible because the tomb is empty? Is there a mind shift that needs to happen around who's welcome in God's kingdom? Is there a mind shift that needs to happen around who qualifies and who don't? Well, fam, then make that shift today. Say to our risen Jesus, renew my mind. 
through your spirit, transform this part of me because it's keeping me away from living in this truth. Maybe feeling graciously loved is your, is your biggest need. Fam, our relationships on this planet is so broken that it can sometimes lead us to a place where we can't experience love anymore. Jesus reverses that. He says, come, I'm waiting for you. You'll see me. No condemnation. No debt. Nothing. Just come. But that's what you need to do today. And you can, in, in a time of prayer and worship, say, Father God, lavish me with your love. Lord Jesus, ignite this feeling of passion and grace and love in my heart. Maybe it's launching you out to live a life mission. Maybe you just haven't told anyone about Jesus. And maybe the Spirit has been prompting you and, and agitating you and moving you with compassion to say, share the good news. Say something. I ran into our neighbor yesterday. It's a new neighbor. I haven't met him yet. I was late. I was under pressure, but I just knew that I had to say something. I just knew it. And we were talking, 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 and his eyes started tearing up, and I was like, here we go. And I said, dude, listen, you've told me that you're a Christian. Can I just remind you that God works together all things for the good of those who love? Oh, and there we go. Needless to say, I was late. <laughs> but I, I just, I felt moved to say something. Maybe you've been feeling that compelling so many times, but you kept your mouth shut. Don't be like the two Marys. Don't say nothing to anyone. Don't be afraid. And maybe that's your prayer today. Lord Jesus, I am afraid. Help me to be unafraid. I don't, I don't know if that's a real English word, but you see what I did there. Help me to be unafraid. I want to speak. Let's close our eyes and let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we'll never be done with your resurrection. Never. We can't stop thinking about it. Our heads are way too small. It challenges our minds in such a big way. We have to revisit it every day, every week, and every year over Easter. And every time we study it again, we feel like that emoji that just has our minds blown. Thank you for turning everything upside down. Thank you for changing everything according to your will. We know that when the tomb is empty, anything is possible. So I want to pray now, Holy Spirit, that you minister to our minds, especially our minds that have become hard and stuck and dusty. Minds that don't believe the truth. Minds that struggle to believe the truth. Help us as it challenges our thinking. Lord Jesus, I see a loving Savior, not on the cross anymore, but out of the tomb with a new body, with the marks that you died for us, smiling and wanting to be with us. I can't imagine your face as you sat around the table with your disciples, enjoying community again, having a good meal, knowing that your job was done. May we experience you in that way. May we experience you as a loving, loving Savior. Graciously loved. Please lift the burden of guilt and shame from our shoulders. So many times, Lord Jesus, we walk around with our own sin and our own brokenness as if you never paid for it. Please, Lord Jesus, lift that burden so that we can experience your gracious love. And Lord, then I want to ask you to make us faithful witnesses of this good news. Make us unafraid. Make us speak boldly. Make us tell people what you did for us. Make us tell people that you are alive. In any circumstances and anywhere. 
Give us eyes to see hurting, needy people in desperate need of good news. May your name be glorified, the risen King, our Lord Jesus. Amen.